Hi, everybody. Hi, hey, Woodcurvers. This is Raymond Kinman from Northern California, checking in with you. Uh, I've been a professional woodcarver full time for 46 years. So I don't know. I, I uh, somehow I rope Blake into letting me show up on on here. And uh, so let's have some fun together. Nice to meet you. Oh, the uh, website is woodcarverguru.com. All right. Thanks for the reminder, Dave. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it is a little bit after 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, this is March the 25th, Saturday afternoon. Uh, I want to thank everybody again for coming in on this Saturday. I know everybody has a lot of things going on. I uh, appreciate you taking time out with uh, the International Association of Woodcarvers. Uh, today on our meeting, we've got a special guest with us. Um, Mr. Raymond Kimmins coming to us from uh, Grass Valley, California. Uh, I'll have him on here in just a second, but before we get started with him, I wanna tell you a little bit about what we have uh, that's coming up in the coming weeks. Um, next Saturday, we just signed on today, Mr. Dave Stetson, who is in the meeting with us uh, today. He's gonna to come on and do a demonstration. I'm actually gonna be out of town with my daughter. She's got a uh, college tour and uh, Dave's always gracious to come in, step in with us uh, when we need somebody, and uh, we look forward to having Dave present. Uh, Dave's got a class that's coming up on April the 22nd on wood carving the Waving Walker. Uh, so hopefully this will kick off uh, uh, people signing up for his class uh, and give you some information about that. So again, look forward to Dave coming on next week with, uh, with Dave Levy. So it'll be the Dave and Dave show again. Uh, I'll be out, but I'll definitely be watching. Uh, on the... Um, the 8th of April, uh, Van Kelly is going to be coming on with us. Uh, he's going to come on and uh, talk a little bit about his uh, YouTube videos. And uh, hopefully we can talk uh, Van into doing a demonstration as well. Uh, on the 15th of April, Matt Atlin is going to be joining us. Uh, a lot of people have asked about these deep holler knives. Uh, so Matt is the owner and maker of deep holler knives. And uh, he's joined our meetings in the past a few times. Uh, he's actually getting ready to come into the meeting now, uh, but he will, uh, he'll be joining us on the 15th to talk about those knives, tell you about where you can get them, how they're made, uh, answer any questions you may have about those. So again, that's Matt Atlin on the 15th. Uh, as far as wood, wood shops or workshops, I'm sorry, it goes again, Dave Stetson has a workshop coming up on April the 22nd. On April the 24th, Janet Cordell has a class that's going to be starting. Uh, it's on the Old Faithful Horse. And on May the 20th, Del Green, who I also saw in the meeting, uh, is going to be teaching a class on caricature dogs. Again, if you're interested in any of these uh, workshops, you need to reach out to the instructor, uh, contact them directly, and uh, sign up for their class through them. They'll tell you all the materials you need, uh, take the payment, give you all the information that you need to be able to get uh, started with those classes. So reach out to those guys. I want to remind you, Dwayne Gosnell is doing a Whittle Wednesday class. Uh, you can contact him directly. Uh, Chris Hammock's still doing bar fly classes. And Al Lacasse, or Lacasse has the fundamentals of wood carving uh, that he does through his website. If you're interested in that, reach out to Alec. Uh, so that's some of the things that are available uh, virtually out there. Um, I think also that Ray's going to be talking a, bit, a little bit about uh, some things that he has that are available. Uh, so at this time, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, again, introduce you to Ray. Uh, Raymond Kinman from Grass Valley, California. We appreciate you coming on today, Ray, and uh, we look forward to hearing what you have to share with us. Hopefully people have some questions for you and uh, you can tell us all about your carbon journey today. Sounds good. Thanks, brother. So do uh, you want me to start now, Blake, or do you have to run something? Else? Oh, no, you're going to use, never mind. Start now. Hi, everybody. There's some good carvers here. I've been paging through the, uh, the lineup here. Hi. Nice to, nice to meet you. Uh, you know, when Blake asked me to, to do this, I, um, I, you know, I mean, like, why would anybody care? <laughs> like, what do you want to see? So I thought, well, maybe I can, like, just show a gallery of my, my work and talk about, um, you know, how I got started and that kind of stuff, because it's kind of a weird story. I've been a full-time professional woodcarver for 46 years. You know, this is all I've ever done. And um, I started when I was 
so young, I didn't know that that was pretty much impossible. I thought it was a thing. So that, that probably gave me an advantage. Uh, so I'm kind of at retirement age right now. Uh, I'm not interested in retiring. I just love what I do. I just couldn't imagine anything else. So um, I thought maybe I, could, I have a slideshow I put together for you. We could do some Q&A kind of stuff and she, you know, take you on the journey here a little bit. So, uh, Blake, I'm going to go to share screen now. Is that what yeah, if you would go ahead and share screen and uh, pop your slideshow up and then make it full screen, you should be in good shape. All right. I'll let you know when it comes up. Should be now. There it is. There we go. All right. So, uh, you know, it says Master Woodcarver here. It's like... Uh, <laughs> I do not think of myself as a master wood carver. Uh, I mean, when I was younger, you know, I didn't get out much in the world. And in my small little world, you know, I, I thought I was pretty good until I went to Europe and in Asia and saw the carvers throughout the world, the masterful work that's out there. And it's just, you know, I'm better than some, not as good as others. But some of the stuff, if you've ever, ever been to Europe, you know, it's like, that will make you feel like a rank amateur. So, but the word master, you're kind of stuck. So there it is. So some of you may know, I've done a bunch of work for Disney. I kind of had a lucky break there. Um, I do deep relief wood carving mostly, sometimes, you know, low relief, sometimes high relief. If you don't know what those are, ask later in the question thing. So uh, this is jelly tong wood. I use that almost exclusively. Um, if, you, if you've never carved jelly tong, it's really great for carving. It power carves well. Mostly I do stuff by hand, but I use power tools too. If you look at this picture, you can see, see the groove going around the the um, pattern that's done freehand with a, a router to get the initial stop cut and depth. And then the rest of the stuff is done with hand tools. Sometimes a Dremel or, you know, rotary tools too. Then I finish it up with, with uh, tint stains and paints. Um, more on that later. So, yeah. See, you know, I did this. Uh, this uh, Imagineering asked me to come in and do the other Walt Disney Imagineering, if you don't know. That's the think tank for um, where they dream up the stuff for the theme parks. And they asked me to come in and do a demonstration. And, you know, the younger Imagineers are, you know, everything's done computer now. They don't really do any hands on work, they don't know about it. So the idea was saying, come on, you're on and do a demonstration. And I brought some tools and some wood and we all carved up a stone, it was great. I mean, the world needs more wood carvers, but they know what a CNC is. So I'm just jealous. So here it is. That's what I do. All right. So most of the scope of my work now uh, is I, I do commissions for private uh, for Disney collectors. There's a whole Disney art collector world out there that I knew nothing about. It, but it turns out, um, you know, um, that's mostly what I do now. So I'll show you. That's a fireplace mantle you're looking at. It's for a, a collector's um, private library. 
up in Ashland, Oregon. I'm gonna give you another look at that here. So this was supposed to be a video, but I'm not sure how to, pull. oh, there it is, right there. It's a Beauty and the Beast theme. Um, show it to you again. That is awesome. How long does something like that take you to carve? Man, yeah, that's like question number one I get every day. Uh, I don't track my hours. But to me, that kind of distracts from the creative process. So I don't really pay any attention, but a lot. There's a lot, a lot of work in this. This uh, design was done by um, uh, a I was working with David Lucas. He's a fellow Imagineer of mine from the old days. We did the original Indiana Jones adventure stuff together, and we still work together sometimes. So how do I get out of this screen? Uh, okay, that didn't work. Are you guys seeing this? I don't know what you're seeing. We see you. Yeah, we're still seeing you, Brett. Okay. And I screwed up somehow. Hold on. Play from current slide. That's what I should do. You may have to go back into screen share and to share it again. Okay, it's Zoom. That's where I should go. All right, I'll try that again. Share screen. There it is. Hey, you're there seeing. Are you seeing yeah. just just the mantra, or are you seeing my uh, presentation? No, we can. We can see the whole presentation. So, uh, right. yeah. Play from current. I don't know how to start this. Let me play from start. We'll go through this again. I'm just going to skip forward because I don't know. How yeah, you're good. All right. Uh, so, that's kind of a detail from the other end there. You can see that the roses weren't, weren't uh, painted yet, nor the vines going around the outside. So, the scene. I don't know if we can see this whole scene. I think I got it in here. There's the, the other characters. This is from Beauty and the Beast. And um, the collector that I did this for uh, had a, a painting done above the fireplace mantle. It was a scene of Beauty and Beast falling in love. And if you remember the theme of the movie, it was like uh, Beast was under was put under a curse by an enchantress that he was going to have to remain a beast until like he fell in love and the the last uh, petal fell off the rose. So the scene that you're looking at in this mantle, they're looking up at the painting above them, celebrating, these are the, the four servant characters, the fact that Beauty and Beast were falling in love. And that's a library scene back there. There it is. Now you can see the whole thing. So you're all kind of looking up at the painting above. All right, I think you've seen enough of that, right? All right, yeah, so I'll show you some of the stuff I've done for uh, Imagineering. Um, I've done a lot for them, like dozens of carvings, both at Disneyland and Walt Disney World, a little bit in Tokyo. Um, but I don't have photographs of quite a bit of it. Those would be in a box at my ex-wife's house somewhere, which means I'm never going to see him again. <laughs> you know that story, <laughs> right? But so, yeah, this is eight feet long. It's uh, Honduras mahogany. And this is high relief on the ends, the cobras on the ends. You can't see them very well. Those are two curled up cobras on the ends. Those are done in high relief. And you, by the way, we wanted this one, the original plan was to make it look like an artifact, like something you'd stumble across in the jungle somewhere or something. So we didn't put any sealer on it. It was just raw wood, stuck it out in the sun, the elements. And you know, it looked like hell after about a year, but it was perfect. <laughs> it looked really good. That one's still there. This is seven feet long. It's Honduras mahogany. 
Uh, many adventures of Winnie the Pooh. That's uh, that's high relief as well. And I'll show you how I did that in just a second. But if it's hard to see in this picture, see uh, Tigger's face and his whiskers down there. Those were coat hangers from my my closet. I was like trying to figure out. I was carving this, and I, my son was my nine year old son was in the room, and. I was going, I can't do these whiskers. They're just going to break off. And so it was his idea. A little nine year old thought of it. Here's the coat hangers, and it worked. <laughs> they're still there, too. A little bent up, but they're there. Um, so I want to show you how the high relief was done. That's the original artwork that I had to work with. And then uh, the other picture is while I was in my studio. You see the outlines of the characters. Uh, so that's like 16 quarter mahogany glued onto the board underneath of the substrate. And then it's carved as one piece. You carve right into the background so it looks seamless and natural like that. High relief. Uh, that's still there today too, Pooh Corner. This is six feet by three, maybe I'll come around there. Again, Honduras mahogany, high relief. There's the original artwork for it, uh, which is in my, my hallway right here. I was supposed to turn that stuff back in when I was done, but I, nobody asked. <laughs> so I kept some of them. That's the original one. And you can see it while well, it was in my studio. The, that's the glue up on top. I'm sorry, these are the best photographs I have. Where gluing the mahogany to the surface there was a clamping nightmare. I didn't have a press to do it. I had to just get bar clamps out and put as much pressure on it from every direction that I could. So, <laughs> and then you, if you look at the bottom one, you can see that Tigger's face is not carved yet and his nose is just stuck on there. So you get a good uh, a picture of it in process. That's the Hungry Bear restaurant. That's a redwood log. This is my first chainsaw carving. I uh, have been doing a bunch of carving for them there. You know, everybody was happy. And then my boss came in and said, you know, can you do chainsaw carving? You know, full on dimensional statues. And I had never done it before. So, you know, I had two choices. I could tell them the truth. You know, I'd never done it before, or I could lie. So I, did, I lied. I said, yeah, sure. I could do chainsaw carving, right? And, and, and so I got the gig, and, and then I'm going, now what am I going to do? You open your big mouth, Raymond. What are you going to do? So I had a friend in Northern California who was doing some chainsaw carving, and I called him up. He said, yeah, come on up. And I spent a week with him, and he taught me what tools to use and how to do it. So that's my very first one. It's still there today. If you notice, his arm doesn't fit within the diameter of the log. So his arm is actually bolted and glued on and then carved like one piece so that I could get it done there. So those, that's the original artwork there for both the concept uh, drawing and the actual outline specs. The, the actual piece came out a little different than the drawing, but that's normal. Involves some interpretation. There's another chainsaw sculpture I did for them. The original concept artwork done by Larry Nikolai, who's another Imagineer uh, friend of mine. And that was, uh, you know, it's hard to find a log that big. That's a big tree. I mean, you can't just go cut a tree down. So it took me a long time to find this log and finally found it and you know, transported it down to my studio. And, um, you know, notice there was like little termite holes and I didn't think much about it. You know, it's a piece of wood. Carved the whole thing, everything went, went great. And then um, uh, after it was done, like two days later, I get a phone call from my boss going, uh, there's like 
thousands of termites flying out of the sea. So you get something woke them up and got them angry and it was totally infested. And that was a lot of work. That was a hard piece to do. So um, I was like, I, I expect I just gonna have to do it all over. Um, but we decided to try and fumigate it and it worked. So they were able to save that piece. This is the Country Bear Playhouse from the Country Bear Jamboree. This is eight feet long, Honduras mahogany. Most of the stuff I've done for Disney is mahogany. High relief, you can see the characters and the pine cones on, on here are deeper and, and richer. Um, one of the questions I get is like, what's the hardest piece you've ever done? Most difficult, and it's gotta be this one because uh, well, I didn't tell you when I was, I, I didn't do a lot of chainsaw carving, but after my second accident, I decided there wasn't going to be a theory. So I stopped. But, and my second ha accident happened right before this. I was working on some Pocahontas displays and I lost a finger in a chainsaw accident. It was pretty ugly. But I still had this to do. And um, my arm was in a cast. I mean, the whole, I couldn't use my left arm. So I carved most of this with one hand. I made a little jig for my cast to hold, hold my couches. It was hard, hard. And I did get some help on some of this too. I had a couple of carver friends come in and, and help me out. So, but the, yeah, I did that on one hand. Oh, by the way, this sold a couple of years ago at auction. So what happens to those old pieces at Disneyland is that you know, they squirt them away in a warehouse and then they sell them to collectors. They auction them off. And this one went for $85,000. Amazing. I don't, I think I undercharge for that one. So this central character, let me go back. See the guy in the middle? His name is Big Al. So Albertino was an Imagineer and he, the country bear thing was his invention. And he was so um, outspoken and gregarious. They decided to make a character out of him in the show. That's Big Al. They're on, look at his face. That's him as a bear. So I don't know how they do that. How do you make a bear look like a person? I don't know, but they did it. Yeah, that being just said, you know, what I'm doing today, uh, mostly I do commissions for uh, collectors. I think I mentioned that before. Um, the, a lot of them are like front porch signs. Like, you know, in this case, that's what that was. They're hanging a sign by their front porch. And it's an Indiana Jones uh, theme. Same kind of thing. The Nightmare Before Christmas theme. I like that border treatment on that one. It came out really good. This is high relief too. Same kind of thing. This was for their vacation cabin up in the mountains. There was a lot going on in that carving there. There's a lot going on. Same kind of thing. This is for a collector's private tiki bar in Hawaii. So you can see it on the left. Well, it's, this is high relief. You can see where the, the pieces are glued on. And then it's carved like one piece. Looks like one piece must done. This is a recent one. This is for a couple who are getting married. Um, that's the bride and groom posing in front of the airplane. They, um, they're both aviators and Dis Disney nuts, Disney fans. So uh, they got married in, a, in an airplane hangar. This was the present from the groom to the bride. So they wanted Mickey and Minnie as aviators. And, and it's the, the idea was to make the design look like it's an aviator badge, like an old vintage aviator badge. And when the ceremony was done, they, they had chartered that airplane there in 1936, I forget, Lucky. And they flew off in the, into the sunset. So it's that kind of thing. 
that one's right here next to me right now. This kind of thing too. It's not all Disney collectors. I mean, I used to do a lot of uh, nature themed stuff because I lived up in the mountains and tourist areas like Tahoe. So I did a lot of this kind of thing. This is also high relief. Uh, see the pine cones and the eagle are stuck on there and then carved like one piece. So yeah, here's an upcoming one. And this is for a collector. This is a gift from, um, from um, a woman to her husband. Her husband has, uh, and he's a big Disney, you know, Donald Duck fan, right? So that's Scrooge McDuck. And apparently you know, her husband has done really well in business. And so this is just kind of a, a thank you, doing good, big, you know, thing. And so this is going to be mounted into the wall, like it's a wall safe and carved very, very deep. I mean, we're probably nine inches of depth on this one. And it's Scrooge McDuck sitting there counting up his, his money in his treasure room right behind him. If you remember, Scrooge McDuck's got this big old treasure room with his booty in it. So this is upcoming. Looking forward to this. And, and the, this door, uh, the safe door on there, um, that's going to be done with forced perspective. So, um, it's, so it's not really a door that's swinging, right? It just looks like it is. Yeah, what else? Hey, this is his, this is Ducky. Uh, I'm also a big Duck Donald Duck fan. Hey, uh, I got a question for. Uh, since you worked for Disney, do you have copyright issues? Speaking <laughs> of money with this, what, what's I was waiting for that? How do, you, how do you how do you get around this? Yeah. So I I mean it's a valid question. It deserves a good answer, but I can't answer it. Uh, there's this confidential NDA stuff. I can't. Comment. Oh, I got you. I got I you. you. So I just, I'm sorry. Good no, question. Okay. I, I understand. No problem. Thanks. So there's a door in the middle and with two side light windows. I do other stuff, you know, besides uh, relief car signs and uh, relief carvings, you know, fireplace mantles, doors. Here that is from the inside. So you can see it's backed up with marbled glass. So the lights streaming through into the room behind it. And there you can kind of see it from the inside with the door open. And if you go back to here, you can see the branches flow across all the panels. So it's all tied together into one kind of composition. This is alder wood. There it is on the house. I just happened to catch it at sunset and it was like shining off the glass behind it so I got a good picture there yeah that's a mahogany door that's actually in my bedroom door I carved a long long time ago and, and I recently carved this as a gallery piece so it went in an art gallery to uh, take commissions but it wound up not working there anymore and I used to use it at art shows when back when I used to show and then it just sat in a shed for a long time and so when we built this house, we we put it on our uh, our bedroom. Finally, I have one of my own pieces in my house. So if you look at the uh, the door, the installed door there, you'll see how the floor kind of comes out and turns into the handle. So you actually grab hold of the carving to open and close the door. This is a mahogany door, wondrous mahogany. All right, I'm going to show you some of the color work. Uh, this is a video too. Well, that didn't work. Sorry about that. This is supposed to play a video. That's how that part's done. 
Now, how do I get to there? We go. All right. So the story, you know, I, I, I you know, I always say that, you know, there's zillions of wood carvers better than I am, but I've had some lucky breaks, and I'm self-taught. So, as you can imagine, there's a story about that. I'll tell you how I got started and somehow how this morphed into what it is now. So this was 1977. I was living at Lake Tahoe at the time. I was just a kid, um, a professional musician at the time, you know, playing clubs and casinos up there, and which I still do. But that was my gig. And, um, you know, I just figured I was going to be a rock star. So that was my uh, chosen profession, and that was going to be it. And then... There was a wood carver up, up at Tahoe. His name was Ron Ramsey, this guy here. Um, and these great car signs, they were everywhere up there. I mean, you couldn't miss them. He just he was a very prolific wood carver, done some great stuff. And so I would notice them around town a lot. And it, um, I always admired them, but it never occurred to me that I would be doing that something. Matter of fact, I, I worked with Ron Ramsey for a few years there. Um, and a, a couple of years down the line after I'd actually gotten my start. So uh, I'm still friends with Ron today. He's retired. I, by the way, I know there are other wood carvers that have made a career out of it, a full time career. And there must be, but the only two people I know that is myself and Ron Ramsey that have made a full career from, you know, young adulthood to retirement. So <clears throat> anyway, and then so still at Tahoe playing music. And I, of course, met this cute little hippie chick and uh, accidentally fell in love. And, you know, she kind of came to me and said, Raymond, we're going to have a baby, right? And I was like, we are. Uh, <laughs> You know, remember that feeling, right? I mean, I, you know, it was really clear to me that, uh, you know, being a musician wasn't going to cut it, not for a family. And so I was kind of looking, not knowing what I would do. I had, you know, didn't have any education. The only thing I knew how to do was play bass guitar. And I had no other skills, but I was looking. And um, I had a friend of mine who uh, was opening a restaurant. We were having a conversation. It's opening a restaurant. And in passing, I, would, I said, well, who's going to make your sign? His name was Marty. Marty, who's going to make your sign? Because I wanted to recommend Ron Ramsey because I loved his work so much, right? And Marty looked at me and he goes, I don't know. He says, you know, Ron Ramsey is just too expensive. You know, I can't afford him. She said, why, why, do you know how? And uh, it's like, my brain stopped for a second. I'm thinking really fast, you know, <laughs> really fast. It's like, no, I don't know, but uh, here's my chance. Maybe I can do this. So I just told Marty, you know, sure, I can carve your sign. And I didn't know anything about it. I had no tools, no money. No place to work, no woodworking experience. I couldn't draw. And yet I thought I could probably carve in the sign. So, you know, it worked. It didn't come out that great. I borrowed 30 bucks from my dad to buy my first two tools. And I just, I went around and asked questions. I mean, you couldn't go to YouTube, uh, you know, or the library. I had I go down and look at Ron's work and I tried to figure out how he did that. Or where do I get a piece of wood this this large? So I'm asking a woodworking friend of mine, like, oh no, you gotta glue that together edge to edge. And I thought, oh, okay, you know, so I glued it edge to edge and it came out like this, you know, because I didn't know how to clamp it. I didn't know you needed to mill the wood to make it fit or use waterproof glue. Yeah, you know, just it was a really interesting process and I, I got through it uh incidentally these are my first two tools that i borrowed 30 bucks from my dad to get and i still use them all the time 
every day. So, I mean, I got through it. The sign came out terrible. I, I don't have any photos of it. I really wish I did. But I got through it. And um, as, like, my son came along, it was you know, kind of a scary situation. It really was. That's a, that little baby that came along. And so, yeah, this one is a couple years after I started. I was starting to get some stuff going but it was still pretty bad this this sign is still there at lake tahoe i, I did this probably 1979 or 80 something like that i mean at the time i thought it was pretty good you know i look at it now and i go see that big that white stuff that was supposed to be snow and then i have a cabin floating in the middle of the lake <laughs> it's just sometimes these the, look at the old pieces is so painful but it's still there well, you know, I practiced and I, I got better. Mm -hmm. A little at a time. Uh, eventually, I wound up working with Ron Ramsey for a couple of years. I became his lead ghost carver. And um, so I actually was doing all the work. He would do the design work and dealing with the, the clients. And they need to go skiing. And I would carve them and paint them the whole thing. So I learned a lot from Ron, Ron Ramsey. But most of it was being self-taught. And back there, there were no computers. So I had to learn how to hand letter, you know, draw lettering by hand. And I really didn't have any experience with it. Um, but just a lot of practice over and over and over and over again. So um, at the time, I was starting, you know, my family was growing, and I thought it would be a good move to go to Los Angeles for a couple of reasons. One was, I wanted to see if the music thing was going to go, you know, if, whether I had a shot at it. I had a little bit of success there, so I wanted to really give it a go. And I wanted to get out of a small town and into a bigger city where, so that my carving business could grow. So we moved from Northern California to Southern California, and I started my carving practice there from scratch. By the way, how I started... Uh, I don't know how I, I don't know how we made it. I don't. I mean, literally had no money, nothing, and I knew I had to get my work seen. But how do you do that? There was no, you know, Facebook back then. No, nothing. So I rented a spot at a swap meet. You know, an old drive-in theater where every Sunday they'd have a swap meet. And I spread out a blanket. I didn't even have a canopy. I just out there in the sun put some carvings on the rug in front of me and carved just to get it in front of people. And, you know, that's how I got my work. It was mind-numbing struggle. I'm telling you, don't know how we made it. So I take it, uh, we took our kids to Disneyland like parents do one day. You know, and I grew up near Disneyland. I never really paid much attention to it. It was just, oh, it's Disneyland. That's where you go stand in line for hours and hours and hours. Right? That's about all I thought of it. But I was taking my kids there. And, you know, when I got in there as an adult, I'm looking around going, man, these guys are good. I mean, they're really well done here. And I'm kind of looking around going, you know, I could probably do this. I, I think I can do it, this kind of thing. And so I thought, I'll look into it. And so I, I found out that uh, at Dis the Disney Parks uses Walt Disney Imagineering, and that's where they do all the design work for, for this stuff. So I looked it up in the phone book, and there is Walt Disney Imagineering Burbank, or Glendale, and I didn't know anybody's name. I, you know, so I just started sending pictures, you know, package, promo pack, one after another after another, no reply. Um, but I kept doing it, and this went on for a couple of years. I mean, now I suspect they just take those and toss them in the trash. I, I, I don't know. I never got any any response and after a while I just kind of 
shrugged my shoulders and you know i kind of figured okay it's not going to happen so I, I stopped i stopped doing that and it wasn't long after um I don't know how long it was, but pretty soon after I did the last one, I sent maybe a matter of weeks or a couple of months. I got a phone call and it was uh, Chris Barker. He was the senior graphic designer for Imagineering on the phone. And uh, when I say that uh, there's a zillion woodcarvers better than I am, I just had some lucky breaks. That was one of them because he didn't, get my work from the, all those pictures I was sending in. He walked into a restaurant where I'd done some work and saw some of my carving and got my number from the restaurant manager. So it was just a lucky break. And, you know, he asked me if uh, he'd like to see some more. Could I send him some pictures? And I did. This was before email. And um, about a week after that, he called me back and he says, listen, can you come in and bring your portfolio? I'd like to take a look at it. And I thought, oh, sure. Yeah, I'll go in. And, uh, I was terrified. <laughs> I was really terrified. I mean, yeah, I'm self-taught. And I'm, I knew I was going in to meet with some of the best artists and creative minds in the world. I knew it. And uh, so I was scared. I was intimidated, scared. And uh, so I got my portfolio and I went in there. We went into a meeting room in the back. And I was going through this labyrinth of just amazing stuff. Uh, you should see it backstage. It's amazing. All the stuff they're working on, models, and yeah, it's really great. So I'm getting more and more intimidated and we go into this boardroom, you know, with a big board table and there's you know, 10 or 12 Imagineers sitting around the table and my heart's beating like this. <laughs> and uh, so they went and showed them my work. I brought a couple pieces so they could put their hands on it. And um, I, they interviewed me, uh, some very pointed questions to them. I mean, I, I I guess I did okay, right? And um, so the senior, the art director, uh, I said, well, you know, this, this looks pretty good. We got something we'd like you to take a look at. And I, you know, I thought, great. You know, they're gonna test me on a little open and close on something, right? They're gonna try me out. That's great, that's you know, all that. All I could ask for. So he gets out these blueprints and rolls them out on, on, the, on the table. And I like took a big deep breath and my heart's beating because it was that one. It was in the energy Jones thing. And it was like my very first one, they're starting me on the top, right at the top. Um, you know, so we start talking about it. We're working on, you know, some ideas and de design snags. And and uh, at one point, I just kind of stopped. And I said, look, you guys, I looked around the room. I said, I, I really want this job. And then my next thought was, Raymond, you idiot. That was the stupidest thing in the world. You should have never said that. <laughs> you know, but... David heard me, the art director, the lead uh, art director. He looked at me and he smiled. He says, yeah, we can tell. And I got it. So that was my very first one. It went on, it, you know, it was amazing. So I, I went to go to backtrack, man, that little baby I told you about. And when he grew up to be this guy, that's my son, Shane Kinman. He's uh, 44 now, and uh, he's one of the best carvers I've ever seen. I mean, his work is great. I'm going to zoom out and show you. This. Look at the look at the detail on that. That's a door. Look at the bark texture on that door. It's amazing, beautiful stuff. Now you can look at it up close. 
I mean, every little feather is just amazing. Beautiful stuff. Shane turned out to be an excellent carver. He also is a full-time wood carver. We don't work together. Um, his studio is in Southern California, but he's still carving. Here's an, another one of his. I use this when I'm teaching this picture because it's such a good example of relief carving. You know, relief carving is a little different than in the round carving. There's some tricks uh, to making the eye believe that the composition is deeper than, than it actually is. And this is a perfect example of that. Excellent work. So what's next? That's my first two tools. Wait, I forgot this was in the slideshow here. So uh, what's coming up? All right. I can now remove the, <laughs> you may have seen when I post I say former Disney artist. I can take the former out now and I can't say anything more about it. But that's pretty exciting. CNC, you know, um, I don't know how you feel about CNCs. I think they're great. Um, and so I'm going to be doing, I actually have started doing some CNC carving. Um, I've ordered one, but it hasn't come yet. So I've been using a, a friend of mine, I've been working together, and I'm not going to do production work. That's not at all what I have in mind. Uh, you know, I'm an artist, I'm a self-employed artist and you know, other artists can make reproductions. They can do signed limited editions, you know, where they do their piece of art once and then they reproduce it. So I wanted to try that and see if I could do that. You know, if I could do the original and then do a 3D laser scan of that and then make limited edition copies. Uh, there's still a lot of hand work essay. And so I, I tested, first I wanted to find out, could it be done? And I had Craig Nelson, my friend, help me in, and I uh, found out if we, we could, it worked. Then I want to find out, is there, is there any market for it? Will people buy these things? Because they're still pretty expensive. You know, my, my original work is beyond the middle classes, you know, very well-to-do people. But, you know, would, would people buy them? Yes, turns out they would. Um, and then I wanted to find out, is it profitable? Is this, you know, I have to go through all that. And turns out it is. So that's next. I'm going to be doing some CNC stuff. And I, this, here, I'll show you my first few um, CNC pieces. I don't know why this isn't working. Thumb's not working. Yeah. So that's a mirror frame. That's my wife, Marisa. Uh, the original was hand carved. You can see on, on the left. Um, that's Joe Yutong Wood. And then uh, they had a 3D laser scan done to make the model. And then the uh, the main part of the mirror is roughed out on the CNC. and. Then we come in and do hand carving on top of that too. So it came out pretty good. It did. So this is the second one. This is a serving platter. Uh, this one's mahogany. And so that's about 20 inches long. Again, the original is hand carved. Um, and then 3D laser scanned and then roughed out on the CNC and then finished up by hand carving as well. I really like, I've got one of those I can show you here in just a second. And another mirror frame, who's the fairest one of all. And then this one was kind of a, I don't know, kind of a side thought. One time, I, um, I don't know if you've ever seen Jeff Ferris's books on carving the human, uh, Face. And uh, I picked up that book and, and I was recovering from some surgery. I don't know how to tackle, I don't know how to do that. And so I did one of them. Yeah, I put my own thing to it. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to take the original and scan it. And you know, it came out pretty good. There's, you know, there's still some hand carving on here, but those are my new uh, signed edition CNC things. Uh, there's more Disneyland carving coming up. Remember I mentioned earlier that I went down to Imagineering and 
we got our hands dirty. That was the project that we worked on. Now they didn't do any of the Mickey stuff. They just, you know, carved the background areas out and we had a great time. So yeah, there's more coming up. So what else is next is uh, I'm teaching, look at Santa came. <laughs> I'm teaching a lot. Um, well, I don't plan on retiring. Um, I do plan on passing the torch, you know, so I figure the world needs more wood carvers. And so this time in my life, when I'm just gonna pass what I've, what I've learned on it, it's all, everything I've learned is by trial and error, just finding out what works, what doesn't work, what, you know, and it's a big long process. So I'm teaching now in a couple of different ways. I've been doing maybe some of you, well, I know some of you have been here at the retreats. So I, I've seen some of my students here on this podcast. So um, we're doing these three day intensive wood carving retreats. These are absolute beginner level. Most of my students have never picked up a tool before. They can't draw. They're just regular people. So, uh, and I'm telling you, the stuff they're putting out is amazing. I mean, and, and here's why. I mean, what they do in three days took me years to get to that level. It did. And uh, the reason is that uh, because I'm self-taught, I had to figure this out. I had to reason through what and why I'm doing what I'm doing and how to make it better. And because I had to reason through it, I have a really good, uh, effective way of teaching it. It's a six step process. It's kind of like a recipe. First you do this, 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 doesn't matter what the carving is. It could be a rose, a mountain scene, a Mickey Mouse. It's the same process, no matter what. And um, it works. I'll show you some student, student stuff. Now we're booked up, by the way, we're booked up we're, there's a handful of spots open up at the end of 2024. It's just turned out, you know, when we first started this, I don't even know if anybody would show up, but it's gotten really popular. So people come from all over the world. So it's been uh, really good. But look at some of these student projects. These are first time carvers, never done anything. It's amazing. It's just really great stuff. And if you go to my website and look at the student carving page, it'll blow you away. It's just great stuff. And there's nothing like it. You teachers, you know, the guys that are doing teaching, nothing like it when the light comes on in students' eyes and they and they are looking at something and go, I can't believe that came out of my hands. That's a very gratifying thing. You know what I'm talking about. So I have an online instructional video. This is also very beginner level. That's why my little sweet spot is for beginners. It's just teach them how to carve a simple little sign like this. And uh, it's a good place to start for a beginner. There's a lot of stuff on there. It's very well done. It's not a 10 minute YouTube video. This is a you know a 90 minute thing. So I put this out several years ago. It's doing very well, so quite a few of those. So, um, and then upcoming, next. All right, it's in production right now. This will be done, I hope, next month, if we can get the editing done. Um, it's another, uh, this one is color and finishing techniques for wood carvers. We're all wood carvers, including CNC carvers. Um, <clears throat> you know, one of the questions I get all the time is, what, what what kind of paints do you use? What brand, you know, and all that. And it's not that, it's not, it's the techniques. That's what you're seeing. It's years and years and years of trying and learning and trying to find out what works. And it's mostly that. I could use crappy paints and still put out something pretty good looking. So this is about techniques. And the project I'm going to be doing on the video is this all is well carving. Um, so all wood carvers can use that te those techniques on anything they're doing. Though. But um, if you, you can also do it on this one because it's gonna come with a, a CNC model. 
so that you can uh, you can have the model made and you can practice using this particular uh, design uh, or not. Doesn't matter. So it's going to come with a CNC model. Even if you don't own a CNC, you can you know someone that does. Or go on Etsy. There's millions of uh, CNC guys on there. So that's the idea. I hope it hope it's out next month. Looking forward to that one. And that's the end. That must be the end. It says thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, hey, this, is, this is Ducky again. Hey, uh, uh, this is for uh, Blake and uh, Dave. Are you guys going to put the stuff on the uh, the YouTube for his classes and books? Yeah, we'll uh, we'll put a link out there, Duck, for all the uh, the websites and stuff that he has available. So it'll be okay. available. Thanks, sir. Sure. Hey, Ray, if you want to go back to uh, full screen, I guess stop sharing there at that point. We'll go ahead and open the floor up for any questions anybody may have. All right, I'm going to try that. How do I do that? I do. Sorry, you guys. I struggle with email. I don't know what I'm going to do with the CNC. Stop, <laughs> stop screen sharing there, Ray. Stop. Thank you. That's You're welcome, it. brother. There we go. All right. <laughs> Thank you. No problem, man. So Ray, we did have uh, we did have a couple questions in the chat. I'll go ahead and throw one out. Uh, somebody wanted to know the difference between Julatong and Honduras mahogany, and why you choose one over the other. Mm. Great question. Julatong is uh, a blonde color, kind of like basswood. They look very similar. It's very very tight grain, almost no grain at all. I mean, it'll do whatever you tell it to do, but it's a little too soft. Uh, it doesn't hold minute detail that well, but it also power carves well. So you can use rotary tools or hand tools on it. Um, it's kind of hard to find, but that's my preferred. I have a lot of it. I've got sheds full of this stuff. Um, so that's my preferred wood. It's the color. It's softer. It's, it's, it's actually really soft. So it's really good for students. So they're not struggling with, with uh, you know, the wood grain, not so much. Um, so that's my preferred wood. And a lot of it has to do with color. I like the color of it. But uh, actually Honduras mahogany is, is better carving wood. Um, that's even harder to find. It, it was, uh, you know, for years and years and years, they were cutting down the rainforest down there and just decimating it. And I mean, they were making sh shipping pallets out of Honduras mahogany. I mean, it was just, you know, it was bad. So they, Honduras government shut it down. So it's hard to find now. I know where, you know, I've got a friend that's got I have wood manufacturing business and he has to be a Disney fan. So He's got lots of it. Stuff. He doesn't sell it, but I, I, I get it from him. So the difference is uh, Hunter's Mahogany is more dense. It's harder, which is good, but it's still soft as far as hardwoods go. Holds detail well, and it does. it's very stable. It doesn't do a lot of expanding, contracting, so it's good for the elements and for things like doors or fireplace mantles. And, uh, and it's got a beautiful grain pattern because um, it's you tongue. You, you look at it and you can't, really see any grain pattern at all. There's the differences and the advantages. Is there a color to that um, Honduras mahogany? What color does it start out as? Yeah, it's kind of a, um, a burgundy. It's very red and rust colored. I've got a piece of it here. Can you see me okay? Yeah, we, we got you. Well, it doesn't look that great in this light, but this is Honduras mahogany. It's redder than it looks on the screen. That's that's one of my CNC pieces. That's that platter, that tray platter that I was showing you. And do you have a do you have a source for the gelatin um, that you can share, or do you just get it different places? I um, I buy mine at wholesale. They won't sell. To the public, but um, that kind of dried up too. So what's going on with jelly tongue? Now you can still get it. Um, the Malaysian government. This comes from Malaysia. It comes from a rubber tree, 
and it's a type of rubber that they make chewing gum out of. So the, apparently these trees, they get really big, but they only produce for a certain number of years. And then they cut them down and replant. Um, so the Malaysian government finally figured out that, hey, we can bring jobs into Malaysia if we stop exporting raw materials. If you want to use this jelly tong stuff, you're going to have to have your manufacturing done here in Malaysia. So they stopped exports on it. But it's still out there, and I'll tell you how to find it. You know, Google probably isn't going to work. Might. Um, I've gotten lucky that way. But so I'm constantly looking for it. And I'll call up, you know, hardwood, specialty hardwood places, guys that know, know wood. And if they don't have it, I'll ask them, who else might have something obscure like this? And they know their little network, right? So we can, so it's a process of getting on the phone. And, uh, you know, when I find it, I buy everything they have. So, <laughs> so I'm the guy that owns most of the jelly chong in, in the United States, I think. <laughs> Hey, uh, another question. Um, they're wanting to know if you have a specific font uh, that you recommend for signs, for words, names, those kind of things. Fonts, yeah. Um, you know, sometimes um, I don't always use fonts. I still hand letter some stuff. Um, but I realize fonts the way to go. You've got a computer, you can trace it out on there. So specific fonts. So for signs, you know, try to keep it, try to um, make them fairly bold. Uh, so you can get some distance on it. Um, nothing too fancy. If you start doing cursive stuff, you know, it can be hard to read. Uh, and I try to pick fonts that are in character with that design. So if it's a feminine design, I'm looking for a feminine font. If it's a, you know, a formal thing, I'm looking for a formal looking font. So they all have characters. A lot of what I do is very playful work. So I look for playful fonts. So that's kind of a way to kind of an overview on it. And what about uh, sealing your carvings? What kind of sealant do you use uh, for stuff that say you're gonna be out, outside? Yeah, that's the, uh, my 50 year long quest to find the perfect thing that doesn't exist, right? right. But I've, you have kind of come to the point where you got, you know, it's pretty good. It's just, or as good as it's going to get. I, but I mean, you put something, a piece of fine furniture out in the elements and the sun's going to win that argument, right? So the stuff that I put out there, yeah, it's like kind of looks cool when it starts aging. That's the way I look at it. But yeah, it's sealed up pretty good. Uh, this will be on my video, by the way, but to tell you, and a lot of this is technique, but the products, that have I found that work best is uh, it's a deck sealer called Penofin, P E N O F I N, F as in Frank, I N, Penofin, Verde. It's their green formula. They also have this deadly chemical formula that I used to use, but they outlawed it in California. So I can only get Verde, and I like the Verde much better. It's much safer and less toxic. So Penofin Verde. And they come in all different colors. I use redwood on jelly tone. So, uh, so take a, do I have any raw pieces here? I do, hold on a second. So, if you can see, I just, you know, once I get the carving done on it, right? Then I stain the background dark. I use an airbrush for doing that. I'll show you the, the final effect in just a second on another piece. And then sand down the surface so it returns to light color. So there's some contrast there. I'll show you in a second what that really looks like. Yeah, I get a little sandy done. And then um, I use Penofin. It's a penetrating oil stain. And you just slather it on there. I mean, you just like pull it up on there and want the wood to drink as much as, it, as it'll do. It'll suck it into the end grain. And then, you know, kind of flip it over, do the backside, wipe it down, flip back over, wipe it down best I can. And then I let it sit for a couple of days, really let that stuff soak in. So it's kind of pickled. And then I do the colors, uh, all the color goes on top of that. 
And then the final sealer is a um, product by Modern Masters. It's called Master Clear. It's got a UV, it's a, it's a polyacrylic, but it's got UV inhibitors in it. And um, I use a matte finish. I don't like glossy, shiny stuff. So it's very, it also deepens the color quite a bit too. So I'll show you what I mean about the airbrush stuff. Can you see this okay, you guys? You getting full screen on this? Yeah, that's good. Good. So the areas in the background here, see how they're darker? Um, so I come in with an airbrush and if you don't have an airbrush, you can use a can of spray paint. That's what I, you know, my students use spray paint, but, but airbrush is much more articulate. So I kind of darken the areas in the background with it with an airbrush, uh, and then sand sand it off in the foreground areas. So you get contrast. You're getting foreground and background. See, so in, in any kind of graphic environment like this, dark always recedes and light comes forward. Right, dark recedes, light comes forward. So I use that. If I want the background to recede, I darken it up. If I have something that I want to look round, I, you know, I put a shadow around the outside there, right? So the dark recedes. So, and then, uh, then I do go through the ceiling thing and the, you know, the master clear at the end, you gotta be careful with that because it's not penetrating. It sits on the surface. So, you know, if it drips, you gotta work those drips out because um, they'll, they'll dry white and hard and look ugly. So that's the magic form. And by the way, I've, I've had really good results with Master Clear with this form and uh, with Jellyutron, but I've had other woods that didn't do that great. But I have a tiki in my backyard that's monkey pot, and um, you know, it's kind of really showing it. <laughs> so did, I think it's the oil in the wood. I'm not sure what, what the difference is. <laughs> Hey, somebody wants to know what your favorite piece is. What's the favorite carving that you've done? Yeah. I've done thousands of them. Uh, all right, I'm going to go with the. Uh, I'm going to. I'm going to go with the Disneyland piece, the uh, Winnie the Pooh, the Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh. It's just got such a playful feel to it. I really like that one. Nice. Um, another question that we have, um, do you prime the wood before you paint it? And if so, what kind of primer? No, I don't. The oil-based uh, penifin, right? And then the colors that go on top are uh, a combination of latex enamels, exterior, and artist acrylics. And you know, I've heard it said you don't ever put water-based paints on top of an oil finish, you can, and it works really well. And you know, this particular combination, I can't speak for anybody else's method, but you know, that carving I showed you, one of my early pieces that's still up, you know, that was forever, 43 years ago. It still looks great. So I don't know, it works. And then uh, somebody wants to know if you can speak about the router that you use when you're outlining your pieces before you start carving. Ah, well, I should have anticipated that question. I showed you the router bit. It's the bit, okay? The, any router will work. Um, I like big, hefty, powerful routers. They're more stable and, you know, but you know, when I first started teaching, I bought all these great, powerful routers for my students. And I found out it was scaring them to death. You know, the power, they didn't even touch the power tool before. So uh, I bought these little small DeWalt, I think it's a DW611. It's got a little LED light on the inside, very little tiny laminate trimmer kind of router uh, because it's less scary. Uh, but Personally, I'd, I'd go with the big ones. Well, two or three horsepower, I think. They're, they're much more stable. And it's the bit. So when I first started carving, I don't know if anybody's ever done freehand routing before, but it can be very difficult to, to control a router. I mean, it's like, whoa, 
And I couldn't do it. That very first carving, it was a sign for the Rep Marty's restaurant, right? Uh, if there was a straight line, I had to set up a straight edge and, and push it and to get a straight because I couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. Um, and then one of the things I learned from Ron Ramsey, um, the guy I wound up working with, and I'll tell you how he learned it. It was uh, his, uh, let's see, who was it? His father-in-law? I think, I can't remember who it was. But it, Ron couldn't control the router either. And he was talking to his father-in-law. And his father-in-law was talking about he knew a, a aerospace tool designer. Um, you know, a regular router bit just has these these uh, bl uh, you know blades that go around and chop the wood, right? And the guy's going, no, don't do it that way. You need a spiral fluted tapered up cut, which means what? <laughs> what does that mean? Um, so it tapers to a point, right? Tapers to a point like that. The flutes are spiraled around around it. And I'll do it upside down. And so, and when it's cutting, it's pulling all those chips and sawdust out of the channel. Uh, and so. Hey, Blake, well, I have one here. If um, you want to see it, I can show it. Hey, Bob Flanagan has one. Let me spotlight it. You got one? Yeah, cool. Yeah, Bob, spotlight. There you go. So you can get them now. I, I used to have to make them by hand and I made my own router bits, but now you can get, you gain them on the market. It's CNC router bit tapered okay. down to a ball, ball point. Like, I don't know what the, just tiny little point on it. And so when you use this type of bit, it's like, it's wonderful. So just, you're just like coloring book. You're just following lines and it works really well. So I'll go ahead and open the floor. Does anybody else, before we conclude here, anybody else have, uh, have any questions uh, for Ray at this point? All right, Ray. How's, how does the end mills work on the mahogany? Could you say that again, please? How, what's the cutting? Um, is it difficult to cut with a router and an end mill? That's the tool we were just talking about um, on the mahogany. Or is it just as easy as the gelatin? It's the same. It's really easy. Yeah. Um, it depends on how deep you go. If you start cutting really deep, it's going to burn. Right. So, okay. So I'd do that in stages, you know. I, I wouldn't cut more than a half inch at a time. Okay, cool. One other question. We've got somebody asking about how you uh, determine uh, the pricing when you're selling one of your carvings or how, how would you recommend a, an artist to do that? <laughs> well, that's a tough question. I'll do my best. <laughs> okay. So because I don't track my hours, you know, it's not – the, the, the formula we normally use, you know, the time for money thing doesn't work. Yeah. Um, and I got to tell you, um, I've made a lot of mistakes in that area, so I'll tell you what those are. The first is that for the longest time, I tried to make stuff as cheap, not, not cheap, that's the wrong word, as inexpensive as I could. I was trying to make these as affordable as I could. And... Um, no, I was struggling. And what I've found is that that doesn't work. If people feel like it doesn't cost enough, they, they don't attach any value to it. So, uh, I mean, now I've got a very healthy carving practice and I really great clientele. So these are very expensive uh so i'm gonna make money uh but and when i first figured this out i had a friend who inherited a piece of property from her dad and it was in the hollywood hills and it was a, a steep considered unbuildable lot it was right on the hillside going down into a canyon and so she had this property she wanted to sell it. she put it on the market Nothing. It was on the market for a year. And then her contract was coming up with the real estate agent. And the real estate agent said, yeah, well, Rita, why don't we just, for kicks, try it? Let's triple the price, right? So they did that, and it sold in one day. Wow. 
that's where I got it. I went, oh, it's not my job to try to make this affordable. It's my job to um, make it's something of high quality, high value, and people will pay for that. You know, that's one thing like CNC carvers tell me. Yeah, but you know, somebody else is going to do it faster and cheaper. Well, good. <laughs> that's, the advent of the CNC has made my business take off because people still do like handmade things. So I don't, I don't try to work cheap. How do you price it? I don't know. You got to find what that value is for your property, right? Don't know. Question, Ray. When uh, when you're coming up with your Disney figures, do your Imagineering friends help you out designing those, or have you picked it up over the years working with it on your own? Yeah, I don't I don't draw very well, but I can draw, and I worked by myself for decades, so um, I'm just I don't like drawing very much, and it's really hard for me. But I mean, I can. Do it. So, but not anymore. So I, I do have some friends helping. D David Lucas was the guy that the original art director for the Indiana Jones thing. We work together sometimes. And I have another, uh, a, a, one of my students actually, um, who is a Warner Brothers uh, animator. And so I do uh, you know, like the upfront kind of stuff, the concept, dealing with the client, kind of the, the idea, and scrubble it out. And then it goes to one of those guys to draw it out you know, and make it into a pattern. So I didn't, I didn't used to, I do now though. All right, uh, Ray, we're, uh, we're coming up on about 20 after. Hey, Blake, um, so real I'll go quick. ahead and go ahead. I'm sorry. I sent you the uh a picture of that whole bit through messenger okay. so you can post gotcha. it whenever you do your other stuff absolutely bob thanks for doing that i appreciate okay. it yep it, thank you and i sent the amazon link from the last time i bought it after, right after ray's class so perfect I'll, I'll add that as well thank you for that so uh ray i just want to say thanks uh your your work is amazing um i think you've added value to everybody that's been in the room regardless of the kind of uh carving that we do and uh, so I want to say thank you for sharing. Thanks for coming on. A um, lot of good information. And uh, I'll probably go back and rewatch this a few times because there's, there's some things I want to try out as well. So uh, thank you for sharing that. I uh, want to remind you all again, uh, we meet every Saturday, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time uh, here on Zoom. Uh, make sure you share this opportunity with other people. Uh, again, next week we'll have Dave Stetson on. Uh, on the 8th of April, we'll have Van Kelly, and on the 15th, Matt Atlin. Uh, so we got quite the lineup coming up. Uh, I'll be working hard to try to line up some other carvers. I've been in contact with some that's been on here today uh, that's committed to come on. So I'll be uh, sharing that lineup in the coming weeks. And uh, remember that uh, we meet every week. We're carvers helping carvers. Doesn't matter what you carve. Just get out there and carve something. So uh, thanks again, Ray, for coming on. And uh, we'll see you all next Saturday, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you all. Like you're muted, buddy. Gotta unmute yourself.